So we've been talking a lot about things that are uh, positive behaviors to engage in to, you know, improve our motivation, our, you know, our focus, attention, dopamine system, um, replenishing the baseline. There's also behaviors to avoid as we kind of we're touch touch on a little bit, and uh, you know, probably one of the biggest elephants in the room here would be the technology, our, our smart devices, our smartphones. You mentioned the brain loves visual information, yeah. and you know, also the fact that we're addicted to getting, you know, looking at our likes. And when we get a lot of likes, I mean, we get a dopamine peak, and it's it's you know, we we it's rewarding, right? And so yeah, hugely rewarding, and sets the um, expectation for the next next time. Right. You know, and the algorithms are very clever, right? Every once in a while and you know, a new account comes up. Uh, I know someone who recently started posting and you know, and post gets some feedback, post gets some feedback and then boom, something takes off, gets a million and a half views. That that will change their relationship to social media maybe forever. It's just chasing that thing. And uh it's very clever. It's very clever. Not always diabolical, but but very clever. Yeah. So, I mean, what is that there's a couple of questions. I, one is, you know, like, what is that doing for our ability to live in, like, everyday life that isn't like that, right? First of all, the visual visual information isn't there. It's not as, you know, moving rapidly and all, all, all that things. And also, um, you don't get that huge peak from a million and a half views. I mean, like, everyday life isn't usually like that. And then the second is, how can someone have a more healthy habit? Like you and I, we have to use social media for our work. And a lot of people are like that, you know? And so there's there's a, like, how, how it, it, what's the healthy balance? How can you find it? Have you found it? Um, have I found it? Um, most of the time, not all the time. I think two things, one is an observation, one is a perhaps a suggestion. Um, to everyone. Um, the observation is that disengaging from social media takes time, but it happens very readily every single time. So for instance, get off work, you're still on your phone, you're still on your phone, you're with family, still on your phone. They're like, hey, want to engage. You put it away, expect some agitation. Expect like something's been taken away from you. It's this kind of low level malaise other things aren't as interesting. I mean, hopefully one's life is interesting and hopefully isn't just drawing us out out of like urgent demand. But it, there, it requires a little bit of time. If you've ever gone camping or you don't have access to your phone, in fact, this coming weekend, I'm gonna take three days away from my phone. And I'm sure getting back to the phone will feel a little bit oppressive. It'll feel like a little bit oppressive. But once the phone is away, expect, I don't know, 20 minutes to an hour during which you don't feel quite right, maybe even some underlying anxiety because it's that it's that unconscious anticipation. So that's my obser so that's the observation. The suggestion uh, I have for people to have a healthy relationship with social media is one actually that I learned from a professional poker player, which is play for time. Don't you know, if you're winning, don't stay there, right? You're losing, don't, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I don't wanna suggest people gamble, but this is all just translating to social media. Play for time, designate how much time you're going to spend on there in a given bout. You know, so for me, getting a post up once every day or so, maybe four times a week is kind of the goal. And I try and mix up the form of post and I have rules for myself. Most specifically, I try and make sure that 90% of posts are so the audience can learn something useful, hopefully also interesting um, and actionable, et cetera. 10% are kind of from my delight, I can't help it. Or where I'm um, curious about, I'm kind of pinging the audience for their thoughts because I genuinely want to know. Like I was walking up the Upper East Side with my girlfriend a few weeks ago and saw this sign outside a store and said, um, we have, a Ozempic and Monjaro, and I took a picture of it and thought, that's kind of weird. It's normally you see like we have lattes or something, and I just kept walking. And then when I got back to California, I posted that on social media. I thought, kind of curious, what do people think of Ozempic and Monjaro? I know it's controversial, I'll just ask people. And it just, it was tons of engagement. I didn't even expect it, but I'm learning a lot from all those comments. So I have rules, but the main rule is I don't let myself, or I try to not let myself pick up the phone and just any at any old time and go into social media. I really try. I don't always succeed, but I really try. And if I'm gonna be on there, I'm like, okay, I'm on here now for an hour or I give myself an hour. That's the best thing I can do. I also know that if I answer a few comments, I, I'm kind of a runaway train when it comes to pe people pinging me with questions about science. I just, 
it's very hard for me not to reply. So I have to limit myself to, you know, five to 15 responses. And I'm like, and then I, and then I actually feel some anxiety as I go to do my life activities. And I have to tell myself they'll be okay. It's just, it's just kind of like you ask a professor, at least this professor, a question about something. If I know the answer, like I'm going to try and tell you. So there's always that agitation, but um, for me, so expect that agitation when you set it away and play for time. Don't base it on any particular mode of engagement or whether or not it feels good or doesn't feel good. Play for time. So decide I'm gonna be on here for 30 minutes. And it's interesting because when I don't do that, what I start to notice is I'm scrolling, but I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, what am I doing here? Like, what the hell am I doing here? Like, I don't even know that I care about this like thing or that thing. It's nice to see people in their events. I love the baby pics and the, you know, the animal pics and um, our friends in the podcast space. It's always great to see and to learn. I learn a lot from your posts. I genuinely do. I learn a lot from Lane Lane Norton's posts. I, I genuinely do. And 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 I really enjoy the podcasters, the public facing health um, folks. But I know also, and I remind myself that for me, the real raw materials for the podcast unless it's a post from you, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not just saying that. The real raw materials tend to come from PubMed. They come from books. They come from papers that I'm reading, thoughts that I'm gonna have, like conversations I'm gonna have. And so those are the raw materials for my work. And that social media is more of a, a mode of consumption and occasionally broadcast. X and Twitter, totally different picture. Because I now go on X and Twitter and I know they're gonna try and get me through a... Um, let's just call it a psychosocial dynamic. Someone like you're, you're on there to see how people are gonna engage. It's, it is a little bit more combative. It also can be really supportive because of the immediate retweet function. You see something you like, it you can get out to a lot of people, you can link out to things, but it's more of a, um, like the center of the town square where everybody's interacting. And um, so I have, I have very clear um, cognitive pictures of, Instagram feels pretty benevolent to me. You know, people have to generally show their face, right? X feels like, okay, do I really want to engage in this very intense dynamic? So I, I go on X far less and I've had much more polarized responses to things that I've put up there. I've had things clipped out of context. I've had attacks and, and I just don't enjoy being angry. I don't enjoy feeling that friction. It just sucks for me. And I don't like seeing other people suffer. So. On X, I see just a lot more of that and I've got nothing against it. And I, I think they've done great things with the platform, but I just, I have to just be really protective of myself to not go there terribly much. Is there like um, like studies that have shown that the, there's a, a maximum amount of time that like adults, maybe children versus adults should spend mm -hmm. like with their smart devices to, you know, for, for prevent these huge amplitude and peaks and dopamine where they're just getting, you know, really rewarding things or even just, like you were saying, negative things, that can be, in a, in a way, it's very, oh, yeah. you know, you're getting that, like, engagement and oh, then, yeah. you know, it's... The, the clap back, you know, if you get a good clap back on somebody. I mean, there, there's a, a neuroscientist up at University of Washington, Sam Golden, who's shown that, you know, animals will work for the opportunity to fight. They'll work for it. We never understood this until recently. I mean, you could say we always understood that, but no, like, you know, humans probably do. The, the, you know, engaging in those kind of high intensity ways can be rewarding for some folks, even for people who don't like that, unless they're really conflict averse. It has a certain level of arousal, like arousal itself can become rewarding, right? Just the, the engagement, when I say arousal, like the level of, of cognitive engagement, especially if the rest of life feels kind of passive and uninteresting. Um, there have not been clear studies that I'm aware of, at, but at the same time, if I think of something like virtual reality, like my colleague at Stanford, Jeremy Balenson, has done, he's one of the early pioneers of virtual reality. And as virtual reality came to be, they established, and I'll get the numbers wrong here, so forgive me, Jeremy, I have to look this up, but you know, limits of, you know, kids should only be in the VR goggles for X number of minutes per day, and it was minutes. Otherwise, there's rewiring of the visual system and vestibular system, the balance system in ways that might not be healthy. They had real clear limits and guidelines with social media, sort of like as much as you want. And then of course, there's the intrusion of social media in and tablet use and phone use into sleep, where then you're depleting the, the, the replenish, where you're undermining the replenishment of the dopamine reserve, right? So then there's all that contextual stuff. I think an hour a day on Instagram, if you think about it, that's a pretty significant investment. Um, and 
with X, I can't even make a recommendation. I do go on there and post. I have a kind of a bittersweet relation to it right now. Lex Friedman, uh, my buddy, our buddy, is um, has a far more um, kind of uh, symbiotic relationship with X. He, it just sort of like works for him, whereas I feel that more on an Instagram platform. And um, it's just it's different cultures, and maybe I need to adjust my follows and 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 so on. But I think an hour a day to me just seems like okay, that's plenty and is enough. What role do you think that going to things like Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, um, this this context switching where you're you know you're working, but then you're checking Twitter, and then like it, what role is that playing in our our ability to focus and attention, ADHD like symptoms? I mean, there was like a st I read last night like one in nine children has ADHD. Now I don't know like wow. what that actually means but yeah wow exactly mm -hmm. um so yeah i think um the the because i grew up and spend still a fair amount of time in the bay area although i'm in los angeles far more now um an interesting question is always to ask the um heads of these companies or the ceos how long they let their kids be on social media and you'll often find that it's a very very small number and that tells you something right there Okay, so I think um, the task switching, the context switching, no doubt is impairing adults' ability to adults' ability to engage and stay engaged in one thing. Reading a book, unless it's extremely engaging, is going to be less uh, attention um, harnessing than social media. Why? Because social media is movies. Why? You're scrolling. I mean, the brain has never seen this kind of thing before. Even if you have 300 channels on your television you know, and you're scroll just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling at short distance with the feedback of people you recognize and which isn't true for most people with t watching television or, um, and feedback and likes and comments and clapbacks and attacks and um, reward. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I think I'm, a, you know, I, I'm a content consumer, but I'm a content creator as you are, um, of course. And I like to think in terms of, are we consuming content or are we creating content? And just being very judicious about consumption of content. I mean, I think it's great fun and I encourage people to put stuff out on the social media. In fact, um, recently a clip was cut. I, there was like a math gaffe um, that I did. And I, I came out and apologized for the error. I occasionally make errors in podcasts and we put them in the captions. But anyway, put something out there. But the, the caption to that post was, you know, I would hate for anyone to resist posting their creative thoughts, their creative outlet um, for fear of, of attack or making mistakes. I think we need to, I, I sound kind of like, you know, it's sort of party line now, but um, to foster a community of people like encouraging people to, to create stuff and put it online. But that's different than just passive consumption all the time. I think there's so much good to be had with social media, but I think an hour a day on Instagram, maybe 30 minutes a day on X and you're good. And even there are 90 minutes out of your waking day. And then what part of your day? This is important. You know, when I look at the, my day, I know that when I wake up in the morning, I'm a little groggy, but then I've got three or four hours that if I can get, if I'm going to get really quality work done, it's in that three or four hours or the three or four hours right after lunch. And that's it. I'm not the kind of person that's doing quality work now between the hours of 8 p.m. and midnight. It's just not happening anymore. It happened years ago, but it's not happening anymore. So where is that 60 to 90 minutes falling is also key. Maybe it should be for an hour or so before bedtime, provided it's not too stimulating. Maybe it should be over your lunch break and you just handle it then. But when it's first thing in the morning, then several times throughout the morning, and then later in the afternoon, and then in the evening, I, mean, I think what I'm describing is not unusual. And not unusual, not just for kids, you know, Jonathan hates work that's being discussed so much now about social media consumption and the, the, the challenges and, and concerns with that, but also in adults. I mean, since when, I'm 48 years old and it's kind of remarkable. I mean, I see people from my high school class and like, I'm one of them, so I can only laugh at myself here, but it's like we're grown adults, like posting what we did and like showing it off to the world. It, there's a kind of teenage element to it. It's kind of like silly. If I really step back from it, I go, wait, like are the adults behaving like kids and the kids are behaving like adults? Like what's going on here? And again, there's use of sharing science and other creative crafts and, and but, well, aren't they chasing but, the yeah. dopamine? The dopamine like? I yeah, mean, getting likes. Yeah, it getting, just shows that adults are, just, yeah, and, adults are just as prone to it. But it, it's sort of, if we step back and looked at ourselves like an experiment, we'd say, wow, you know, like the, the, uh, 
the people in the you know 35 to 60 year old range of this species that we call human is kind of like doing the same stuff that the kids are doing. It's and maybe you just say, well, duh, but it's interesting. I mean, it, you know, and you say, well, like how how good or poor of one's life is that? And so I think about this stuff a lot. Um, but I'm on there and I teach and I enjoy it and I learn and um, you know and I'll continue. But I have to, but I think one has to be really discerning and set constraints. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if it's tapping into your dopamine system and you're, I mean, if it's if it's kind of like that substance, right? It's technology. It's not methamphetamine. It's right. not cocaine. Right. But it sure as heck is affecting your dopamine system. And so- it, it absolutely is. And it also has the potential for a lot of problems. You know, I, I, this isn't a domain that, you know, I have expertise in or that is covered on the podcast, but, you know, there's this guy on um, who's done some podcasts with Lex Friedman and he's been on a few others, James Sexton. He's a, he's a divorce lawyer in New York. And he talks about how the advent of social media has created this huge surge in- um, I don't know if overall divorce rates, but then, you know, he talks about the trajectory of a lot of the failures of a lot of marriages. And it's like, you know, that, and actually people have talked about Instagram as like one of the main dating apps. It's not sold as a dating, it's not offered as a dating app, but this is where a lot of people meet. They see people they used to know, hey, how's it going? And then the, the conversation converts. I mean, this is, you know, I'm, I'm neither saying, I'm not passing judgment. I'm just saying, you know, there's a lot in the landscape of social media that lends itself to too much ease in certain types of human interaction and that inhibits our ability to do things that are really functional for our relationships and for our professional lives and for family. I mean, you know, or just presence, you know, just like being there. Um, I, uh, not to get um, sentimental here, but that graduate advisor I was talking about before, unfortunately passed away young. She had the BRCA mutation, died at 50. Her name was Barbara Chapman, had two lovely daughters. Actually, the second one just finished university in neurosciences. So I was super happy for her. And I'll never forget at her, um, it wasn't her funeral, but it was a kind of like celebration of life thing after she ended, that her daughters, maybe it was one or both, talked about how one of the best things about their mom and their memories of their mom was unstructured time with her where she would just like sit with them and hang out and they would just like do stuff and she wasn't heavy user of the phone so that was 2014 she passed away um so phones were kind of really beginning to pick up in terms of, of their use smartphones but I, I that rung in my mind because i was thinking wow like of all the things for children to remember about their deceased mom it was the unstructured time it wasn't the the Giants game, although they probably remember that, they were big Giants fans or other things, but it's the unstructured time that we spend with people where they are giving us their full presence and we're giving them our full presence. And then you look around at like dinner tables now and restaurants, you look around and like everyone's on their phones. Anyway, I'm saying what everyone already knows and I'm guilty of it too, but I think we the world is due for an adjustment.